Hello and good afternoon. So I'm going to present on uh, the post-op critical care management of patients who are coming out of the OR. And uh, the post-op outcomes actually are a complex interplay of the type of the surgery which is performed, the immediate um, uh, post-op events, as well as the comorbidities, comorbidities that these patients have. And as we are encountering increasingly elderly population, the redo, redo cases. Okay, how do I move it forward? Okay, here you go. All right, thank you. And we are encountering increasingly elderly population, redo, redo cases, obesity, renal failure, uh, organ transplantation, and metabolic syndrome. And all of these factors may impact the outcome of these patients. Aside from the clinical aspect, you are also responsible for um, the pay for performance, uh, public reporting data, for example, the 30-day readmission, the hospital acquired infections, and uh, especially the surgical site infections, which will affect your standing, because you are directly responsible for the performance measures that define a good health care and um, clinical outcome of these patients. So the post-op care image uh, after the first during the first 24 hours that you have to manage is the periop, MI, the arrhythmias, the bleeding, and uh, DVT. Some of these are some of the key issues. Um, you have ultrasound and echocardiography available in the ICU to access the um, central um, uh, venous um, access, as well as for diagnosis and managing the patients. Um, the hemodynamics are very important, whether the patients are hypotensive or hypertensive, you manage accordingly. If your patient is hemodynamically instable and um, is requiring multiple pressors, although you are managing the patients with those inotropes and the uh, pressors, you are supposed to diagnose and treat the underlying um, disease. As well, if the patient is hypertensive, you have beta blockers available as your first choice, depending if the patient is, um, is not on inotropes or um, not uh, bradycardic. And the other um, considerations are um, uh, afterload reducers like uh, nacardipine. And yes, we do use uh, nitroglycerin in our patients. Um, may not be the first choice, but you can use that as antihypertensive. And if the patient is stable and um, can take PO, you can restart the oral medications when feasible. As far as the blood transfusions are concerned, our trigger is the same as any other ICU, which is a, less, a hemoglobin of less than seven grams um, per liter, or sorry, less than 70 grams per liters, unless the patient is hypotensive on multiple pressors and requiring uh, repeated in, uh, volume um, resuscitation or is actively bleeding. The transfusion requirement in critical care study actually showed a lower mortality in patients who were randomized to those the group which had restrictive policy. So if the patient is stable enough to be started on heparin or anoxaprine or a fondoparino, depending on the requirement, you can start the DVT prophylaxis in the next 24 hours. Otherwise, you can stick to SCDs or the TED hose. Other than the heart, the other important organ inside the chest is lung, which equally affects your outcome um, from the, uh, on the, in the ICU and your um, length of stay. So the key drivers of the respiratory outcomes are fluid management and blood transfusion in both intra-op and post-op, which can lead to pulmonary edema or transfusion-related acute lung injury. Those patients who are intubated, they can either be divided into the fast, uh, fast track. These are the patients who can be extubated within the first six hours if they are hemodynamically and respiratory-wise stable. But if the patient has a reason for not to get extubated, uh, we use ventilator bundles which to not only for the early liberation from the ventilator as well as to prevent the vent-associated pneumonias. There are four components to these uh, ventilator bundles which include sedation holiday um, that also has um, awake, uh, daily awakening and spontaneous breathing trials, um, head of the bed to be elevated to about 30 to 45 degrees, DVT and GI prophylax. All these measures are supposed to help you with to prevent from the vent-associated pneumonia. Of course, early mobilization and physical therapy is crucial in these patients. Now, hospital-acquired infections are common, expensive, and um, preventable cause of inpatient morbidity and mortality. The main are um, surgical site infection, the CLABSI, or the central line-associated bloodstream infection, um, catheter-associated urinary tract infection, and the vent-associated pneumonia. 
Um, these are important as the hospitals are now required to report them publicly and can lead to denial of payment by the insurance companies and also have me medical legal aspects. In 2008, the Centers for Medical and uh, Medicare and Medicaid um, um, Services um, adopted a no-pay rule for um, these patients who develop um, um, hospital-acquired infection and to encourage the hospitals to develop and implement strategies to prevent these infections. And all these strategies are bundled into groups which are called, um, you know, bundles for um, vent-associated pneumonia or ventilator bundle or surgical site infection and all that. And I have just discussed the vent bundle with you guys in the previous slide, and the next three slides I'll be discussing the other three bundles. So urinary tract infection in these patients is the most common of all the uh, health-associated um, infections and contribute to about 40% of these infections. Um, Michigan Hospital and Health Association actually came up and implemented with the bladder bundle that, that is adopted by most of the hospitals. And the A, B, C, D, E of these, this bundle is um, present here. Um, the aseptic insertion and proper maintenance of the catheter, bladder ultrasound to avoid indwelling catheters, condom or intermittent catheterization in appropriate patients. So patients who are incontinent or on Lasix and have to go repeatedly, you can use condom catheters, or patients who are, after the catheterization is removed, they have inability to uh, pass urine, you can do intermittent catheterization based after you do the uh, bladder ultrasound. And of course, do not use the indwelling catheters unless you must. Early removal of the catheter is important, so on your daily rounds, please ask if the catheters can be removed. You may find resistance, but you have to fight back. The next is uh, surgical site infections, which causes about 17% of the hospital-acquired infections and second to the urinary tract infections. And um, they add about 3% mortality to these patients. Um, the components for the prevention of the, these infections are pre-op, intra-op, and post-op. Um, you can see the pre-op and post-op, uh, intra-op over here, and I'll mention the uh, post-op. Um, uh, measures that we take. Uh, the patient education is important, which includes uh, smok smoking uh, uh, cessation, hand hygiene, and pre-op chlorhexidine shower for ma major surgeries for the patient, not for you guys. Then uh, appropriate hair removal for, um, usually that is not required unless it is done in an um, area which, with, with, where the hair are interfering with the surgery. Um, we, we are not supposed to use razors, but actually these hairs can be clipped. Um, equipment and our environmental cleaning, um, which is OR, uh, intra um, OR, and antibiotic pr prophylaxis in these patients is important. Intra op, you have to prepare the skin with chlorhexidine. The surgical technique has to be um, aseptic, and min maintenance of oxygen and normothermia is important during the surgery for uh, pre uh, for prevention of um, you know um, any reason which can lead to um, a, a low immune state and minimizing OR time and unnecessary traffic into the OR. And post-op measures basically include the hand hygiene, um, the wound care with the aseptic uh, dressing, as well as maintenance of the glucose, and of course, within the first 24 hours, try to stop the antibiotics if they are not needed. Um, then the um, catheter-associated or catheter-related uh, blood um, stream infection or the central line infection, there, the new guidelines were presented in 2011, which replaced the one which were um, published in 2002. The risk factors include age. Usually it's more common in younger group, like uh, in children and neonates. Um, underlying disease, for example, the comorbidities, and um, uh, male gender. Male are more, uh, for some reason, susceptible to the CLABSI. So these guidelines um, include educating and training healthcare personnel who insert and maintain catheters, like the person who's doing the procedure, that is you, and who's maintaining the catheters, the nurses. Um, using maximal sterile barrier precautions for glo gown, gloves, and all that. And using 2% chlorhexidine for the preparation of the skin. Um, avoiding routine replacement of the central venous catheters. You do not need to uh, change the catheters every few days just to prevent the infection. Um, and uh, generally, um, the subclavian site is uh, more um, is uh, less susceptible to infection as compared to the IJ and the femoral lines. Plus, you question every day whether these catheters need to be removed if the patient is not on any pressors or is not on multiple drips and not on TPN. We do not need a central line all the time in there. But if the patient is on any of those 
and still needs to continue to be on those medications, consider um, PICK line, which has a lower incidence of um, central um, um, of catheter-related infection. So once you are following all these techniques and everything, in spite of that, you're still having um, um, central line infection. What you can do is using either the, either the an, uh, antibiotic uh, impregnated short-term central catheters, or you can use the chlorhexidine impregnated sponge dressings that are provided. So all these bundle strategies that we just discussed are uh, not only that you have to follow, imp uh, implement, you have to document and report the rate of the compliance with all these components. That is important, important as these are the benchmark for quality assurance and performance improvement. And whatever we discussed, the most important thing is communication. The rounds that you are doing every day with your nursing staff, with your respiratory therapists, and all that, you have to decide plan together how to quick, quickly get uh, rid of the central lines, catheters, and all that, and following uh, aseptic techniques and all that. And of course, the management that we just discussed about the fluid, transfusions, and hemodynamics, they are all, um, they will directly impact the post-op um, uh, uh, outcomes. Um, the public reporting and pay for performance is going to uh, stay there. It's not going away. In fact, the rules are getting even more, um, you know, more and more every day. So you will be question and you are answerable to all of them. Thank you.